Everything in life changes when God adds water to his promises. Jesus steps into the Jordan River for his baptism and, and water streams against his legs. But there is much more going on here than just a man cooling off on a hot day. This was the, the, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his baptism, and as he completed it at his death and resurrection, this was the power of your resurrection as well. Hello, I'm Paul Zell, one of the pastors at Living Savior Lutheran Church in Hendersonville and Asheville, North Carolina. Along with Pastor Caleb Kerbis, I'm very happy to lead you in worship today on this day that is called the Festival of the Baptism of Our Lord. Of course, this is not just a, a recitation of history of something that happened and isn't that wonderful. No, the baptism of, of our Lord is the inaugural event of the ministry of Christ, which gives power, grace, and glorious blessings to your baptism. We're so pleased that you could celebrate such blessings with us as you worship wherever you are, giving careful and devoted attention to the word of Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to read to you several passages that indicate the blessings of your baptism. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. The Gospel of John chapter 3. Surely we were sinful at birth, sinful from the time our mothers conceived us. That's from the Psalm of David chapter 51. But we were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. As baptized children of God, let us confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and fail to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I'm truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water in connection with the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless the apostle paul's letter to the ephesians chapter 5 therefore as a, a called servant of christ and by his authority i say to you what god says your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The prayer of the day. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ faithful in our calling as your children and make us heirs with him of everlasting life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Even before Isaiah was formed in the womb, God was forming him to be his servant a messenger that would carry that, that would proclaim the 
the splendor of God's salvation, not only to Israelites, descendants of Jacob, but to the ends of the earth. Our first reading this morning from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah chapter 49. This is also the basis of the sermon. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I'm honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I have also made you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. John the baptizer was also a messenger for the Lord, proclaiming a baptism of the forgiveness of sins. But on this particular day, when Jesus of Nazareth came to be baptized, God anointed him for a far greater ministry. The Gospel of the day from the Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 1. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Israel went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as John was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. You probably know what it means to be a fly on the wall. We say that when we would love to overhear a conversation that is otherwise private, but maybe quite significant, without being detected. You think of saying that if you've ever watched a sports game, there's a hothead coach and his team tanked in the first half. Oh, to be a fly on the wall in that locker room at halftime. Or maybe you've seen a, a couple or maybe a parent and a child where maybe something happened in public and they kind of quick hush it. But you know it might be an issue when they get home. You think, oh, to be a fly on the wall in the living room later on. Usually, though, we say it when it comes to things that are really important, like huge meetings. You think of the Vienna summit between Nikita Khrushchev and JFK during the Cold War. Or even think of that meeting with Stalin and Churchill and FDR during World War II. Oh, to be a fly on the wall, to hear the back and forth and the conversations of meetings like that. Because when you get to overhear something like that, it, it's quite significant. It gives you information that you otherwise wouldn't have, especially information that you might like to have if given the opportunity. 
Well, this morning, through God's word, you and I get to be flies on the wall in a way. God invites us to the halls of heaven and around this conference table per se are the persons of the Trinity talking about this great plan. And God enables us to overhear this and for a very specific reason. You see, this is far more significant than just the matters of war or issues that would affect an era in time in this world. God is enabling us to overhear this great plan of salvation long before it ever came to fruition in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And here's why that's so significant for you and me today. As we look at the words of Isaiah chapter 49, and God enables us to overhear this back and forth, it gives us this huge perspective, a type of perspective that we need, especially in this day and age, and also a purpose far better than what the world could enable us to have. So as we look at these words, again, the words that Pastor Zell just shared from Isaiah 49, you and I get to see that overhearing God's plan enables us to be far more significant than just mere flies on the wall. So how significant is this? Well, first, it, it helps to know who is speaking here. It has to be somebody that's so significant that they can affect some major change in the world. So could it be someone like a king? He mentions restoring Israel. God would use a king like Cyrus to bring his people back after captivity and restore Israel. But this servant that Isaiah is speaking about is far greater because he's called Israel. It's got to be something bigger. Well, what about a prophet? You can't help but think about, as we read the words of our lesson and look back at them, think about somebody like the prophet Jeremiah, who in his own words in his book would note that God would call him while he was being formed in the womb, even call him by name. Certainly he would use words that were sharp and piercing as, as a sword to, to cut God's people to the heart. But this servant that we see in our reading from Isaiah would have to reach not just God's people, but bring salvation to the ends of the earth and be able to create change that would far supersede that of a prophet, and it would have to be somebody not only bigger, but somebody better. So who could this be? Well, allow me to invite you to look through the lens of our gospel reading this morning, the one that you just heard before from the gospel of Mark. Who could it be? Who is this great servant? And well, first of all, looking through that lens, who do you see? Who else in all of the world could be identified as God's great anointed and appointed one to bring God's people back and to bring salvation to the ends of the earth? Who else could be the one identified as the one in whom God would display his splendor other than the one whom you see the Spirit descending upon as heaven would open and you would hear these words, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Is there any greater splendor than that? Who else could it be except the one standing there in the waters and in his baptism, he is identifying himself with the world as he begins his work to rescue God's people and to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Who else in all of the world could it be except for the one we know as Jesus Christ long before Jesus ever was Jesus that very first Christmas. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, this conversation between the Father and the Son, enabling us to know that the Son of God would be this great servant and would begin that work in time and history in the person of Jesus Christ, bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. And the ripple effect continues. And so when you get to over here, a conversation like that from what we see in Isaiah 49, well, that gives you kind of a great perspective. I mean, it would kind of, it, it, when you overhear something, it gives you a great perspective. Compare it to being able to sit in on like this great national intelligence committee where they're planning on taking out a terrorist cell overseas. You get to hear about satellites and special ops and Navy SEALs and troops on the ground and maybe drone missiles and and other intelligence, you wouldn't just know what's going to happen, and you wouldn't just know why it's going to, or when it's going to happen, you, you get to know why. 
So even after it happens, and whatever news is shared, you have this bigger, broader, better perspective of the entire ordeal. That would be cool. That would be special. That would also be quite powerful. That's what overhearing, being a fly on the wall, so to speak, enables you to have. Something that you otherwise wouldn't from a special conversation. And so when you overhear this, it would seem that you would get this, that, that same kind of sense, this big show of power and might, something that is hugely special, at least as we understand special in terms of this world. But that's not what happens. In fact, the Son of God himself notes that in verse 4 when he says, I've labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with me. This great plan, it would seem like everything's lost, like it was all in vain, that there's no point. In Isaiah's day, you see, Israel's about to be destroyed and led into captivity. Even during Jesus' life, it would seem like all was lost. And when we're looking for God's great plan to take shape, we're looking for like military banners and great campaigning and other shows of political power and might, something that's quite special, something that's got muscles and power, right? Oh, to be sure, we, we look for that. I mean, consider how we pay such close attention, and not just because we care, but maybe because we get caught up in and focus so much in political power whether it's because we're focusing so much on the person leaving the Oval Office or the, the person entering the Oval Office, so much so that we, we're willing to focus on, listen to, and even talk more about that type of political planning than God's plan, which far supersedes a year, a four-year term, and even our lifetimes. Consider how we focus so much on other types of salvation a corner of our life, per se. Call it medical or physical security. If only these things happen and everyone wears a mask and if there's a vaccine and the general population does this and if we, we think so much about this latest report and this latest, so, so much about those things that we think if all of those things just happen then and then, then we're going to be okay. Will we? Or how we focus so much on the security that is found in information, not just the quality of it, but the overwhelming quantity of it. If only we, we learn this and the right people in culture and pop culture and society have the microphone and are saying the right things, then, then we're going to be okay. And then the next generation is going to be okay. So easily we focus on these great shows. We're looking for power in all of these areas in our life. And, and then we're going to, per se, have, have a plan of salvation, security. But the one thing that we should know, especially after this year, it is that Security is something that this world can never give to us. Not in full. It will never last, and it will always disappoint. Looking for power in people, and in positions, and in politics, and in medicine, and in science. Security in all of these places. It is always, 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 and only going to have a time stamp. In fact, according to these very words in Isaiah, the one thing that we should do when we see something that is powerful and attractive as believers, is to ask more questions than to have such overwhelming confidences. Think of it. The world looks for power and muscle and numbers and money, and God was carrying out his great plan when the son was born of a virgin and laid in a manger, and angels appeared to shepherds who now have heaven. A star would appear, and wise men would come from one corner of the globe as salvation would now reach the ends of the earth. The world looks for power and security in health and in medicine in whatever form of science that form of science is going to communicate to us in that given point in time. And meanwhile, Jesus would launch onto the scene after his baptism and he would give to this world a type of security that no amount of medicine or science or vaccine or health care could give. It would be found in a simple message as he would preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The kingdom of God is near. It is in him, this great servant himself. 
and the low and the meek would have forgiveness. The guilty and the downtrodden would have rescue. You see, of all the things that God enables you and me to do, it's not just to look at the beginning and even the duration of Jesus' life as he would be unveiled to the world. Even listen up and lean into these words. In light of what you see Jesus doing at the end of his life, those words that I shared before from Isaiah, remember he says, yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with me. Into whose hands would Jesus end up in the end? Oh, sure, nobody really wanted anything to do with him as even his closest followers would ditch him and he would be left in Pontius Pilate's hands who would kind of at least to assure himself wash his hands of the matter. And yet as his hands were nailed to the cross and his head was hanging as he was bleeding and breathing his last, what would he say? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Into God the Father's hands, the judge of all, would be this reward. And what is this reward? That in Jesus' life and his sacrificial death, certified by his resurrection, Jesus won the salvation of all. In what seems to be ugliness, God is displaying his splendor. In what appears to be weakness, God is conveying his great power. And in what looks like darkness, God is unveiling his great saving light in the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and he is your Savior too. So God invites you to overhear him talking about this saving plan to give you this perspective. And I would argue that it is the exact perspective that you and I need, especially in a day and a time like this. Considering the things that we've seen this last week, this last month, this last year, and even far beyond that, God gives us this perspective that his love for you is so great that while you were forming in your mother's womb, God was already thinking about you long before that. After all, he was thinking about his great servant who was forming in the Virgin Mary's womb. This is how great God's love is for you. It is something that is far bigger than everything we see in political unrest and in violence and in division and beyond. It is something far greater than whatever anyone could try to communicate to you. And since it is something far bigger and better, then God enables us to zoom out and to overhear his saving plan and to know that it is for the world and it is for you and me. He even, in these words, invites distant nations and islands as a way of saying, this is so big, it includes you, and it is already done before it begins. And even if, think of this, even if God's saving work was just going to be for his people Israel, that work in and of itself would be far greater than anything the world today could accomplish if we could all get on the same page. And although that is too big for us, God says it is too small for him as he would extend his saving grace and his powerful redeeming plan to the ends of the earth. And since you are in the earth, that includes you too. Being a fly on the wall enables you to overhear God's plan. It does give you that better and bigger perspective. It also gives you an incredible purpose. You see, if you've ever been able to overhear a conversation, you can't unhear it. When you hear something that's serious and even weighty, maybe it's private or confidential, it's a big conversation, you can't just go back in your ear and pull the words out and forget about them. Once you hear, you know. And with that comes a level of responsibility, which has everything to do with the words before us today. God enables you to overhear them because he makes you part of the action. No, we shouldn't go to either extreme as we think about God carrying out his great saving plan. One extreme being that we overburden ourselves with the responsibility that God's saving work depends completely upon us. And then there's, of course, the other extreme, which is God's going to take care of all of it. He doesn't need us. Or maybe there's just a couple that can take care of it. I will sit on my hands. Thank you very much. No, we find ourselves in the middle road, so to speak knowing that God would send his great servant, the Son of God and Jesus Christ, to accomplish salvation for us. And now he invites us to be part of this action plan as he works through us. Think of it this way. There's this New Testament Great Commission. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, 
Jesus ascends into heaven, and right before that, he says these words to his disciples, all of his followers. He says, go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus was inviting and commissioning his people to go with his saving power, to take the things that they had seen and heard and to go say and do that. These words in Isaiah 49 are sometimes referred to as the Old Testament Great Commission, where God is unveiling this plan that's going to take shape in Jesus, but even already then he's talking about how this is going to reach the ends of the earth. So how in the world now that we know this and have overheard this, there's a responsibility for us to take part in it? Is it going to be really complicated? Is it impossible? How are we going to do it? It's simple. You simply take the things that you have seen and heard, and you go say and do that. All of the things that you have overheard God telling to countless other people, you simply go share that. You don't have to come up with something else. In fact, you shouldn't. You don't have to come up with a new plan. It's the Power doesn't rest on you. God's going to work through it in his own way. He's God after all. But you can't sit on your hands. In fact, as we often say here at Living Savior, if there's one thing we can't do, it's nothing. God who has enabled us to overhear the saving plan now commissions us, putting his word in our mouths, these tools in our hands that we as his church, the gathering of his restored people, forgiven and now restored as his children, would go and share that. And it's just as simple as sharing the things that we've seen and heard. Think, think of a, a man, that I, a young man that I met many years ago. He didn't know hardly anything about God. His view of religion was very jaded and distorted based on some things that he had heard from his grandfather about what God was really like as his grandfather struggled with some PTSD from Vietnam. The very serious and awful thing. As he and I had conversations time and again about God's grace and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, everything he would do to live for us, die for us, and rise from the grave to give us everything this world never could. And it lasts forever, and it's for you. He finally said this one day. He said, I get it. All the while I've been looking for this miraculous click, he called it. He, he talked about, yeah, it's not like I was looking for like the angels or like this glowing, descending pixie dust from the angels that would, oh, and all of a sudden now God's revealing his saving work. No. But, he said, it's like I was looking for this great revelation, something huge to happen. But it's simple. And it's true that God's grace is real and it's for me and it's for you. And it's one of those moments where I know there's no way that I could have ever created that idea in his head. That all to God's credit and glory, I could simply say to him, after thanking God quietly, yes, it's true. God's grace is true, and it's for me, and it's for you. Dear friends, what if you and I looked at every single person that was kind of like on an island of, despair in this world, every person that's caught in darkness in their own guilt, every person who is so far away from being part of the family of believers, what if, what if we aimed all our endeavors in the very same way that God talks about this great saving plan? It was the most important thing of our conversations. It was the thing we thought about more than whatever we see on TV or on our news feed. What if it was the most significant thing, not just according to our time and our offerings and our efforts, but, but first and foremost, our minds, that we would prioritize in a way how the next person would be like that young man I just told you about. The next person, and those people exist in your life too. You know what would happen? Of all the things that we can't know, we do know this. God, in his great saving work, has a way of making waves in lives He's certainly proven that to us. And his very aim, his very plan is to do that through us in the lives of many more. And the ripple effect will reach the ends of the earth and countless other generations. Don't take my word for it. That's God's plan that you and I got to overhear today. 
something we got to be reminded of once again. And since God has enabled us to overhear this great plan of his, to save, to work through his great servant, Jesus Christ, and we know that's for the ends of the earth, and that means us too, then this not only gives us such a great perspective and such a better purpose than anything in this world, it makes us much more significant than just mere flies on the wall. God grant this to us all. Amen. The Apostles' Creed is often called the believer's baptismal creed. It's quite clearly a confession of, of faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, a name which was placed on each of us for our salvation at our baptism. I invite you to join with me in confessing the faith and the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The prayer of the church. Let us pray. Lord God, grant each of us your grace to receive your word with confident faith. Lead us to repent of all of our sins and to find peace in the glorious power and love of your son, Jesus. Give us also the grace to live out our days in keeping with the promises you've made and the gifts you've given to us in our baptism. Bless us with all the needed gifts of the Holy Spirit as we serve you and others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, watch over the homes in which our people live and the children and grandchildren in our care. Comfort those who grieve the loss of someone they love. Encourage those who have suffered disappointments in their marriage, in their work, and in their schooling. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, be merciful to our nation, the United States of America. In these troubled times, you would, we ask that you would bless us with, readers, with leaders who would lead with integrity, with honesty, with wisdom, with the good of the people on, in their charge, on their mind at all times. Bless those who make decisions in Washington and in our state and local governments. Lead them that that they might also lead us in a way that grants peace to your people and many opportunities to share this marvelous gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Savior, heal and help those who are suffering in body or mind. Bless those who are dealing with a setback in their health and well-being and those who are recovering from surgery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, hear us now as we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. On behalf of the members of Living Savior Lutheran Church, I, I'm so pleased that you could worship with us today. We pray God's continued blessings as you continue to grow in his word and find comfort and peace in your baptism. Whether it's in your devotional reading or in your study of scripture that you conduct on your own or in Bible studies that you attend online that we offer at Living Savior, we, we, we look forward to continuing to be the people of the word and the people of, of the Lord's blessed sacraments along with you. Thank you for supporting us with your prayers, with your offerings. If you'd like to give an offering online, you may do so by going to our website, lsavior.org forward slash give. May the Lord Jesus bless your week.